journey Growing freely, no ceiling, no rope Going deep With no stones to entangle my roots Like they do The International Festival of Arts and Ideas is created and produced on the traditional lands of the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pawgusset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac in the land we all call home, Connecticut. We hope that from wherever you are, you take a moment to acknowledge and honor the native people whose land you are on and the history of the place you are in. Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm welcoming you from my home on Quinnipiac land here in New Haven. I act as the curator of ideas programming at the International Festival of Arts and Ideas, uh, and I'm so excited to be here with you. Uh, for everyone watching, if you're not watching in New Haven and are curious about the native land where you are, you can go to nativeland.ca and let us know where you're watching in the comments. Just say hello and what what land you are on the people you are the people you are near and i'm margaret ann Tarkashewski, director of the new haven museum welcoming you from our home on quinnipiac land thank you so much margaret and thank you for joining us for festival 2021 as uh, our year of imagine and we're really excited to be working alongside the new haven museum this year our programming explores both the world as it is today and how it can be in the future today it's our pleasure to welcome you to indigenous writers of connecticut and introduce you to an incredible group of women the new haven museum is honored to be a partner in this year's big read as a learning institution, the museum is eager for opportunities to deepen our knowledge and build relationships. We are grateful and thrilled to have this opportunity to give space to these important voices and celebrate together the incredible diversity of indigenous people living here in Connecticut and add their stories to our collective history. 
This conversation is made possible thanks to the support from the NEA and Arts Midwest as a part of the NEA Big Read and our NEA Big partners like the New Haven Museum and the New Haven Free Public Library with additional support from the David T. Langrock Foundation, Connecticut Public and our 2021 Ideas Partners, Connecticut Humanities. Our Big Read book is Joy Harjo's American Sunrise. Uh, you can get a copy of this book at the New Haven Free Public Library or at a local bookstore. This event tonight and every, excuse me, and the festival as a whole is made possible through the generosity of people like you who are watching it, enabling us to provide more than 95% of our programming free of charge this year. Uh, please consider joining our community of supporters with a gift of any amount today at artidea.org slash donate or support by participating in the Quinnipiac University Arts and Ideas Audience Survey at artidea.org slash survey. And th throughout today's event, you can ask questions at any time using the comment function on whatever platform you're viewing. Your being here tonight is a way of supporting and being with us. Our host this evening is Dr. Siobhan Sr., a professor of English and chair of the Department of Women and Gender Studies at the University of New Hampshire. She is the editor of the anthology Donlin Voices and the corresponding online journal Donlin Voices 2.0. Siobhan will introduce our panel. Welcome, Siobhan. Hello, from New Hampshire, <clears throat> homeland of the Abenaki people, whom I thank for taking care of this place. And thank you as well to all the organizers for putting this together. It really is a momentous occasion. It's a treat for me personally to be able to meet some writers I haven't met before, people whose names were well known to me like Sharan Piper and Candace Testa, but also someone I think of as representing a newer generation, Natasha Gambrell. One exciting thing about teaching indigenous literature and publishing it is that indigenous people are writing faster than I can keep up. That's really wonderful. And it's wonderful also to see writers I've known for a long time, including Rachel Sayet, who comes from a whole family and long line of talented Mohegan writers, and also Ruth Garby Torres, who was one of the tribal community editors for the Scattercook chapter of the book, Don Land Voices, along with Trudy Lamb Richmond. And I wanna dedicate this evening to Trudy, uh, who sadly passed away at the end of April and who was a great writer a great tribal leader and just a great, great lady. So I just wanna take a minute to breathe and remember her. Dawnland Voices, if you haven't seen the book, is a massive collection of writing by indigenous people from this region we now call New England. It's almost 700 pages long and it took almost 10 years to put together. When I was hired at the University of New Hampshire back in 2000, and before that I was uh, for three years at the University of Maine, I really wanted to teach the indigenous literature of this place. And I kept getting told there isn't any, and I knew that had to be a lie, but I was hearing this by the way from professors of Native American literature. They knew about a Mohegan writer uh, named Samson Occam from the 1700s, and they knew about a Pequot minister from the 1800s named William Apis. But after that theory went, native writers just disappeared. And if you live in New England, you know that we really cherish this myth that Indians disappeared. The Puritans were very successful at installing themselves as the first Americans. And if you look at the screen this evening, you're gonna see that that's baloney, of course. The first people are still very much here. I also learned that I was not gonna be able to do a book uh, put together a collection of native writing by myself as a settler scholar, I had to talk to native people. So I started doing that and I learned that um, even though white settler professors and libraries and bookstores may have been ignoring them, indigenous communities themselves knew who their writers were. And one of the first contacts I ever made was actually Rachel Sayed's mother. I cold called the Mohegan Bible archives and this lovely woman answered the phone and she said, oh, we had lots of women writers. We had Emma Baker and Fidelia Fielding who wrote our language and our history. And oh, your name is Siobhan. I'm writing a novel right now with Irish characters in it. She was Melissa Tantaquid and Zobel and she writes wild speculative fiction and now screenplays. And she was one of many people who generously showed me this whole world of amazing writing 
a lot of it in English, by the way, almost as soon as Europeans got here. Wampanoag and Nipmuc people started writing in English to say, get off our land. Um, and Penobscot and Passamaquoddy people started recording their own histories. Abenaki people started publishing their own dictionaries. And then people started writing poetry and fiction and essays and plays. And now we have this whole world of screenplays and hip hop poetry, and it's just amazing. So Don Leon Voices, the book, has 10 tribal nations represented not because that's all there are in New England at all. They are the ones for whom I could find tribal community editors at the time. So this is really a big deal to have writers from all five Connecticut reservation tribes represented here today. And the lucky thing about Donland Voices is that we migrated the book onto a website, donlandvoices.org, because we knew that any collection like this has to be a living document. So I hope that very soon we're gonna be publishing all of the writers you meet here today. And we're really happy that the International Festival of Arts and Ideas welcomed this first Donland Voices event to be held in Connecticut. And a big, big thanks to our main partner, the New Haven Museum for supporting our participation on this panel. Hello. Hello all, I'm Natasha Gambrell. I'm a member of the Eastern Pequot Tribal Nation and I'm just gonna talk a little bit first and then I'll do my poems. Um, so what type, of po what type of writing do I do? I do poetry and I've also done um, some scholarly articles before too with uh, Dr. Steve Silliman from UMass Boston and our tribal chairwoman, Kathy Sebastian Dring. Um, I recently did the NEH on our own grant. It was the Pequot Community Papers um, that was a really good experience. So those are just two examples of the things that I write. What is the inspiration behind my writing? Um, for me, it's been the leadership in my tribe. People like uh, George uh, George Cook, Old Crow. Um, he was a big reason why I write now. And Marsha Flowers, who was one of our former chairwomen. Um, she's another reason why I write. Um, what is what do, what do I or what is my inspiration behind the writing? Um, I would say that it is to. To, to continue to give us a voice. Um, for so long, the state of Connecticut has left our people voiceless. And I feel like for me, writing has given us that voice. Um, okay, so the first one I'm gonna do is called Eagle Feather. Um, it's dedicated to Old Crow and Bobby Sebastian. So it goes like this. <clears throat> Never let an eagle feather touch the ground, Sassica said, as he watched his warrior friend lay dead. His spirit spoke to him. This is not a beginning nor an end. Do not cry for it is my time to fly. Take me home past the everlasting pine trees. Take me home past the land of my people. Take me home past the endless hills, but do not let the sorrow build. Let the people's hearts be filled. Hear this warrior's cry. I'll never say goodbye. I'll be with the creator in a place even greater because with warriors, it's never a goodbye. It's always, I'll see you later. So that's the first one I had. Um, the second one I have, just to set the stage for it, um, it's called, They Were Celebrating. And um, on October 12, 2005, the United States government said the Eastern Pequot ceased to exist, gone kaput, just like that, a figment of your imagination, another powerful tribe thought to be wiped from the history books. Um, I was 13 years old when it happened. So this poem is kind of from the voice of that child. And this poem is the first poem that I kind of started writing and got me into writing. Um, when they tried to take away, when they took away our federal recognition, it was like, for me, them telling them I didn't exist and we weren't here. And I knew that we had existed since the beginning of time and that we had been here and we would continue to be here. So it was a very hard thing to deal with and it made me very angry and hateful. So with that anger, my mom kind of got me into writing and I started writing all of those emotions and all those feelings. So this is this poem. Um, they were celebrating while my heart was cold. It was like a blizzard had swept my entire body. They were celebrating. That day the creator didn't embrace us with his warmth, but instead, left us frozen, feeling his bitter teardrops. They were celebrating while I sat there, twisting and turning, mesmerized by the idea of federal recognition. They were celebrating while the elders were sick and hopeless and the youth were uninspired and suffering ambition. They were celebrating while there was little concern in the air. We knew we were a tribe since we had, we had existence at the beginning of time. They were celebrating as we played honor songs to mourn the loss of our foreign warriors. They were celebrating well, that drum pounded like a bold fist, fighting its way into my ears like the struggle of my people. They were celebrating 
While I passed that red house with the red mailbox, my nerves were already tied in knots, the road in all of its cracky imperfections to, little, to grant forgiveness. They were celebrating while I could see the fire lit and members of our tribe huddled around its burning flame. They were celebrating while we had hoped the past frustrations and attempts at recognition would be wiped clean, a new dawn for my people. They were celebrating while that fax came down and they destroyed us with a single mark of a pen. They were celebrating while history had repeated itself and the government had wiped out another powerful nation. They were celebrating while I looked at my people everywhere in tears, sad that their day of recognition passed by with a colorblind eye. They were celebrating while after all these years, nothing had changed. The white men continued to speak with a forked tongue. They were celebrating October 12, 2005, Columbus Day, while we were left dead on Lantern Hill. They were celebrating while Attorney General Richard Blumenthal stated this was one of the greatest days in Connecticut state history. Those words burned like salt in a wound. They were celebrating the day I learned to hate, but one day we will celebrate. Our time will come to achieve our federal recognition and help deliver our official identity, a wounded, rich, and proud people. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, so like, All right, I guess I'm going next now. Akwai, Natasawis Rachel Sayat, Natasawis Akidusu. Hello, my name is Rachel Sayat and my Mohegan name is Akidusu. I come from the Mohegan Nation here in Southeastern Connecticut. And I'm going to read a little bit from my master's thesis that actually came out in 2012, but I'm working on turning into a book. And it is called Mashup's Continuance Sovereignty and the Literature of the Land in the Aquinawampanoag Nation. It discusses stories of Mashup the Giant from not only Mohegan, but also Aquinawampanoag, which it focuses on. And the term, the literature of the land, actually comes from my great great aunt, Gladys Tantaquidgen, who we're going to talk about here today. But she had an article that was actually published in Dawnland Voices. Uh, she was already passed. She passed away in 2005 at the age of 106, but it was called The Beauty That Surrounds Us. And in it, she discusses the Mashup stories and other beautiful sites in New England. So I'm going to read from this. As the daughter of the tribal historian and medicine woman and the great grandniece of our former medicine woman, Gladys Tantaquidgen, being Mohegan has always been a part of my life. As I began to write this work containing the stories and traditions of my people and other tribes of Southern New England, I realized my perspective was deeply influenced by my family. Growing up, I was surrounded by elders who were steeped in the traditions of Mohegan culture. When I was a little girl, I spent a great deal of time on Mohegan Hill, which is our only area that has been continually owned by Mohegan. With my great aunts, Ruth and Gladys Tantaquidgen, and my great grandmother, Winifred, we would sit at the kitchen table and drink tea. We would go out into the woods and pick flowers and herbs. We would celebrate the Sakatai season and make flags to honor it. The most prevalent traditions that were passed down to me by my mother and my great aunts were stories about little people and giants, specifically those of the leader of the little people, Granny Squanit, and her husband, Mashup the Giant. My siblings and I were told that every time there was a thunderstorm, it was Granny and Mashup fighting. Granny and Mashup symbolize balance. In indigenous cultures of New England, we don't believe in good and evil. It's about balance. There are opposing forces working together. And Granny and Mashup, being big and small, male and female, are a prime example of that. We learn not to talk too much about the little people 
or else they would freeze us. We call them makiawisuk. And in order to keep them happy, we would leave baskets of tobacco and corn in the woods. My great aunt Gladys and her brother Harold Tandequidgen, here in this photo, founded our tribal museum, Tantaquitian Indian Museum in 1931. This tribally owned and operated museum is the oldest native run museum in the country, right down the road from Mohegan Sun. Due to limited parking, they've only recently started marketing. Um, in the past, it was mostly just school groups, but now there's a little bit more parking there. I used to work for the museum as a tour guide in high school. And later on in life, for the past two years, I worked as a curator and an event planner at this museum. I recently just left that position. But I learned from Gladys and my great aunts and my great uncle, who I was lucky enough to know, who was a chief, Harold Tandequidgen, when I was a child. Gladys passed away when I was 19 and Harold when I was about four years old. Gladys spent her life recording the traditional beliefs of Mohegan and Delaware tribes, specifically that of the medicines. She worked to preserve our Mohegan traditions and stories by learning and recording what she could from her great aunts, Mohegan medicine woman, Emma Baker, and the last fluent speaker of our language, Fidelia Fielding. As a young woman in the 1920s, she worked with the anthropologist Frank Speck and contributed numerous materials to his published works. While working for him, she traveled to Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard to record stories from the Mashpee and Aquina Wampanoag tribes. In this paper, through interviews with culture bearers and storytellers from throughout New England, as well as research and papers and books and journals related to these stories, I demonstrate how stories of Mashup the Giant reinforced sovereignty for the Aquina Wampanoag community. My great aunt Gladys began tracking Mashup's footsteps in the 1920s. She even began writing an introduction to a book about Mashup, which was never finished. Today, a century later, I continue on the trail that she began with the goal of expanding awareness of our community and the Aquina Wampanoag community to the general public, as well as demonstrating that the natives of New England have traditions that are very much alive and vital to our survival as modern day nations. This is a quote from Laguna Pueblo novelist, Leslie Merman Silco. We hear a story about a beloved ancestor from hundreds of years ago, but as we listen, we begin to feel an intimacy and immediacy of that long ago moment so that our beloved ancestor is very much present with us during the storytelling. One of the most prominent components of native culture, which has enabled us to survive, is stories. All cultures have forms of storytelling, which contribute to their group identity. For Judeo-Christians, the Bible is composed of stories which lay the guidelines for behaviors and beliefs. As opposed to the Judeo-Christians literate culture, the native tribes of North America traditionally operate through what Walter Ong calls primary orality, a system in which all knowledge is transmitted orally. Therefore, this accounted for all aspects of life and still does. Behavior, religion, beliefs, values, structures, geological formations, and history. I utilize the term story or narrative in this paper, hopefully book, as opposed to myth, to describe the oral traditions of the native tribes of North America, because as Muscogee Creek scholar Craig Womack observes, in an oral culture, the narratives are not viewed as mythical in the sense that contemporary culture understands that word in association with the metaphorical, the make-believe, imaginary. Indeed, stories can be verified with physical evidence in the natural world. They're very powerful and sacred components of native culture and not just anyone can be a storyteller. One must be trained and have an understanding of their stories and the meanings for their community. Some can only be told at certain times of the year. For instance, the stories that I'm talking about today are not supposed to be told in the summertime. So we're really on the edge here. And so I'm going to just express my, my gratitude and my prayers to the creator and to these spirits that I speak of because we are bordering on that time where they are most active. But 
they want their stories to be told. As a Native person, I encounter many instances when our stories are not taken seriously by the outside world. One reason is that these stories are oral traditions and there is no one book that guides these beliefs, although many of these stories are more ancient than the Bible. It is important to insist, as Jace Weaver writes, that these Native cultures are living, dynamic cultures. We'll get into the stories. <laughs> the Aquino Wampanoag Nation of Nope, which is was renamed Martha's Vineyard, has been able to retain a wealth of stories in their oral tradition. Before contact, they subsisted on what they could gather from land and sea and had ceremonies to honor the different seasons. The English came to the Aquinawampanoag homeland and were firmly rooted in monotheistic beliefs and condemned the worship of lesser beings as idolatry. Many Algonquian tribes in southern New England, most prominently Aquinawampanoag, Mashpee Wampanoag, Mohegan, to some extent Pequot and Narragansett, share these stories of Mashup the Giant, which comes from the word Makup, the Wampanoag word Makup, which means stout, strong man. According to Wampanoag people, Mashup is a benevolent being who is believed to have performed miraculous feats and is always connected to the land, sea, and tumultuous stormy skies of Southern New England. In the words of Jonathan Perry, a Quinnawampanoag tribal counselor, he was taller than the tallest trees. And as stated by Mohegan medicine woman, Melissa Tantaquidgen Zobel, he now walks the borderlands between the natural world and the spirit land. There are specific sites around which these stories are situated. Some of them, some of the most important being Mashup's Den and Mashup's Bridge in Martha's Vineyard. In Wampanoag oral tradition, Mashup is credited with creating these sites as, as well as many topographical features in Southern New England, such as the formation of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, which is known as Mashup's Ash Heap. Although demonized by the colonists and not widely known outside of Wampanoag communities, the Wampanoags held on to these traditions and they have always brought strength and pride to their nation. In 1930, Gladys Tantaquidgen recorded one of the most important mashup stories from Rachel Ryan, a Quino Wampanoag tribal member. Mashup was fond of blasted whale meat and would eat a whole whale at a meal. Standing near the entrance of the den, he could reach out over the cliffs, pick up a whale that had been washed ashore, swing it over the fire. The blood and the grease from the whale stained the cliffs. This story is one that I have been told again and again in my visits to Aquino with Wampanoag people. Mashup's den is a sacred site for those people. And that story accounts for the colors of the clay, the yellow from the grease, the red from the blood, and the gray from the charcoal. In this case, archeology span actually corroborates with this story as there are many whale bones found in this specific site. And before we close, I'm just gonna quickly do a Mohegan one. So according to Gladys Tandequidgen, Emma Baker said, the fear of Mashup's size resulted in early Christian missionaries labeling him the devil. Emma taught Gladys that her ancestors had built Mohegan Church near the site of Mashup's footprint because that was a place of special medicine and not an evil one. Mashup was and still is a very powerful figure in both Mohegan and Wampanoag traditions. And it is understandable that the colonists would want to rid the landscape of any Algonquian spiritual figures that could be seen as more powerful than their own Christian God. So quickly, <laughs> sorry, the page numbers here. So the site that we have here at Mohegan, the couple sites I'm just going to speak of quickly, um, we have a site behind Mohegan Church, which is private property, and it's called 
the devil's footprint or Mashup's footprint. And it is actually a large stone that is, that is filled with water. It's always filled with water. And that is where we believe Mashup to have stepped. Additionally, we have another site here in Connecticut called Devil's Hop Yard, which is a site nearby where many ceremonies were happening. And many of our tribes here, that many of the people represented here, we would gather near there because in that area, um, the town of Mudis has earthquakes. Um, it's known as the Maki Mudis, the bad noises. So there was always a sense of a spiritual energy in that area. And so Mashup was uh, thought to maybe have stomped through Devil's Hop Yard. And that is where we say the footprints in the falls come from, in what is known as Chapman Falls. And I'm just going to do a quote to honor Trudy before we close here. And this paper is available on academia.edu as well. And so I'll close with this. This quote is from Helen Manning, before I mention Trudy. Today, when the atmosphere is clear, we look in that direction and see the fog creeping up along the dunes. We say, Mashup has dumped his poodle pipe. We know that the smoke stands as a love for us. Yes, Aquina, Mashup still lives here. When I first visited Aquina in the summer of 2008, while conducting research for the Peabody Museum of Archaeology, I never thought this would be my master's thesis. While dining at one of the restaurants on the cliffs, Tribal member Jeanette Vanderhoop, now a good friend of mine, pointed out a photo of my great aunt, Gladys Tantaquitin. To know that I was continuing the work of my ancestors filled me with a sense of pride. Gladys began tracking Mashup's footsteps in the 1920s. And in this paper, I continue that trail she began. In the words of Scattercoke elder and storyteller, Trudy Lamb Richmond, you're trying to put together a 50,000 piece puzzle. Although this puzzle may never be complete, I have connected some critical pieces herein, and I've gained a deeper appreciation for Mashup's pivotal significance to the Aquina Wampanoag people. How about me? Nia yo. Sago, my name is Sharan Wapatukwe Piper. I am the clan mother, tribal leader of Golden Hill Pogwasset Tribal Nation. We have two reservations here in Connecticut, one in Trumbull and an hour from the Trumbull Reservation and Colchester Reservation. The Trumbull Reservation is the oldest continuing since 1659 in America. Please feel free to like our public Facebook page. Uh, I'm going to read a few pages of Quarter Acre of Heartache book. My father, Chief Big Eagle Piper, who passed away in 2008. He was our ancestor's voice. And so now I am his voice and my ancestor's voice, and I'm going to read a few um, stories. In 1925, at the age of nine, Mr. Piper ran away from the Golden Hill Indian Reservation in Trumbull, Connecticut, for a life in the woods of Maine. In 1973, he returned to fight against the legal termination of his tribe and to protect the land of his ancestors against Blatton encroachment. In the process, he converted the oldest 1659 and smallest quarter acre reservation in America into an internationally known living museum of Indian culture. For 10,000 years, the Native American people from whom I am descended have inhabited these New England regions. They were called Indians by the European explorers who felt they had found their way to India. The name has stuck, but my ancestors were not Indians. They were Native American, the very first Americans. They came as wandering hunters from the North and West. They roamed the wide valleys that were formed as the glaciers of the ice age descended. They came to the east, the land of the rising sun. The earth here at that time was tundra covered with lichens, mosses, stunted shrubs, but over hundreds of years, the cone bearing trees grew up, pine, hemlock, and spruce. Then came the trees we know today, oak, birch, and ash, trees that lose their leaves every year. My ancestors living 
by hunting wild game in the woodlands and meadows and by fishing in the rivers and streams. They were handsome people, short by today's standards, but lean and strong with dark hair, dark eyes and dark skin. Over the years, they learned to till the soil, bringing corn, beans and squash from the earth. Most of the vegetables produced in America today were originally raised by my ancestors before Columbus arrived. Potatoes, corn, even chili peppers. The Native Americans taught the non-indigenous how to grow them. My ancestors also made medicines for over 200 plants, from over 200 plants. They used every part of the plant from root to leaf. They developed cures for illnesses, sores, and wounds of all kinds. Of course, since they didn't know how to write, they left no written records of their civilization, but their ancient burial mounds show evidence of cremation, the burning of corpses. Such a practice suggests respect for the dead, hence respect for life. Respect for life is something we must never forget. Respect for all living things. Many of the tools my ancestors used were destroyed over thousands of years by the acid-like Connecticut soil. Other tools were lost because of the clumsy methods of archeologists who studied them, hoping to learn about the past. What a shame. There is a simple beauty to the relics that have been saved, the bone knives, stone axes, clay pots. Many farmers who have farmed this land in Nichols have found some very important Indian artifacts. They have them in their homes today. Some of the farmers have more artifacts than I do because they have more land. The artifacts help you to imagine the life that my ancestors led. It was very different from life today. It was a life determined by the passing of the seasons. In summer settlements, my ancestors tended to their crops. They lived in wigwams they made by stretching hides and bark across bent poles. After the harvest in the fall, they moved inland to hunt. They spent the winter in temporary villages set in protected valleys where they lived on dried foods and stored nuts. In the spring, they moved to fishing camps along the rivers and the Connecticut coast. And they drank only water until the non-indigenous came. Think of that, no milk, no Kool-Aid or Coca-Cola, just pure clean water. The clothing of my ancestors was simple animal skins furs and leggings in winter, loin cloth skirts and shirts in the summer, moccasins always on their feet. They rubbed oil and fat into their skin for warmth and protection from insects. They decorated their bodies with paints and tattoos. They wore shells and beads on their arms and necks. And until the non-indigenous came, my ancestors were the dominant people in Southwest. Quintucket, the land beside the long tidal river, this is how Connecticut gets its name, Quintucket. The Connecticut River is the largest in New England. It flows for 350 miles from New Hampshire to Long Island Sound. Until the non-indigenous came, the Connecticut River Valley must have been a paradise. My ancestors walked in beauty. In Bridgeport today, there is a street called Golden Hill. My ancestors came known as the Golden Hill Tribe. The name came from certain characteristics of those 80 acres, either the yellow mica in the soil or the sun shining on the tassels of corn. On the basement wall of my log cabin house hangs a prayer that I like to say from time to time. It gives me strength. It helps me be patient in telling my story. Believe that you are a child of the creator that you were born pure with goodness and strength that all his children are born with. Believe that if you have strayed from the teachings of your elders, you are not lost. Readjust your ways and the creator will give you the vision and power to believe in yourself. Acknowledge the creator through thanksgiving and prayer for the strength to do what is right. Ask the elders, elders for counseling to guide your life back to the wisdom of the old ways. Be not discouraged, make your life claim and rewarding, find peace and acquire serenity. Believe that with creator's help, you can regain control. The creator has a purpose for everything. 
He created the native people in his image and gave them natural laws to follow. We are relatives to all living things on mother earth. We are thankful for each day that is given to us by the creator. He gave us a sacred pipe, tobacco and sweetgrass and ceremonies to cleanse our souls. We have sweat lodges to purify our bodies. We were given a mind and soul to look after all his creations, the plants, animals, and winged creatures, as well as this wonderful land. The creator's law of nature is supreme. We must offer our children a life of hope and the right to live as instructed by the creator. We must listen to our elders and heed the creator's will. Unfortunately, the non-indigenous man has always lived by his own rules. He has his own way of doing things. He made life miserable for my ancestors. By the end of the 18th century, only one family lived on the Golden Hill Reservation, the family of Tom Sherman. Tom Sherman was the last chief to live on the original reservation land. What is left of the Paguasset people today comes from that Sherman family at Golden Hill. There were seven members of the family and there were only six acres of land left among them. And before long, those acres were threatened too. I have spoken of the creator, but the first non-indigenous man to come to America called the Indians pagan and heathens, godless, because the Indians didn't worship the non-indigenous man's God. The Indians worship the sun, we still do. We pray to the east where the sun rises. We thank the sun for each day for its heat and light. The, white, the non-indigenous man worships the sun too, but he doesn't realize it. He puts thousands of dollars of glass panels on the roof to capture the sun rays for solar energy. So why should the Indian be called a pagan? In the backyard of the quarter acre of heartache reservation is a sweat lodge. It is a small dome shaped wigwam covered with mats and bark. There is a fire pit inside. Large smooth stones are placed in the center in each of the four directions, north, south, east, west. And there is a large stone in the middle signifying the center of the earth. The rocks are heated, then the medicine man pours water on them, making them steam. The Indians kneel around the rocks and sweat. After the ceremony is over, they jump into the creek. The sweat lodges for ceremonial pur purification. It is a cleansing, like the non-indigenous man's baptism. Really, the religious beliefs of the non-indigenous man and the Indians are not so very far apart, but we must work together to see the similarities, not the differences. But sometimes I find it hard to understand the non-indigenous man. Look at the new housing developments around here. The first thing the developer does is cut down all the trees. Then the people complain that the grass won't grow. It burns up in the summer. Trees give off hundreds of gallons of water in the summer, but they can't help you if you cut them down. And the non-indigenous man hates weeds, especially dandelions. The first thing the white man, uh, non-indigenous man, sorry, when he tries to grow a lawn is to get rid of all the dandelions. As soon as he sees a dandelion, he kills it, but the Indian eats it. In the spring, the dandelions are tender. Tender dandelions are good to eat. They are full of iron. They are excellent for cleansing the system and cleansing the blood. The non-indigenous man must share their ideas for a better understanding. But one thing the non-indigenous man doesn't seem to understand is that the land is necessary to survive. Without the land, there is no survival. You can survive on the land if you treat it right. If you can't, if you can't grab it and develop it, Indians have an old saying, <clears throat> I wonder if the grounds have anything to say. I wonder if the ground is listening to what is said. I wonder if the ground would come alive to what is on it. The earth has much to say, but no one listens. And yet the mother earth is all we have. Aho, thank you. Katapa Tiamu, Natasha, Rachel, and clan mother Sharon. That was a beautiful. We Tapku, Natasuis, Candace Testa, Niwonkwas, Iyanawak, Kwa Natai Mashantakiduk. Good evening. My name is Candace Testa. I am of the Fox people and I live in the place of the great trees. 
Here at MASH and Tucket, I have the great honor of working in my community's cultural resource department as a cultural instructor, where I teach the Pequot language, native crafts, and enjoy assisting with the organization of cultural events, such as Pequot Day, where we celebrate our people's survival of the Pequot War, and Skimitsen, our annual celebration of song and dance that occurs this year on August 28th and 29th. In addition to having a background in cultural sustainability and cultural anthropology, I obtained most of my teachings at the Mash and Tucket Pequot Museum and Research Center. And that was under Trudy Lamb Richman, Tony Whedon, Kevin McBride, Jason Mancini, Steve Cook, just to name a few. The piece I chose to read for you is a digital storytelling class I took at Gulcher College while I obtained my master's degree in cultural sustainability. This was a wonderful learning experience full of amazing professors and folklorists. That said, the piece I will now read is called Aki, or The Land. The land calls to me. While living on the land, my mother would always stress the importance of making noise so the animals would hear me and know I was with them there upon the land. So I often sang while I, while I walked. As a teenager, my friends and I would hike upon the land in search of the magic that can exist among the shaded moss, whispering grasses, and the seemingly never-ending maze of blueberry barrens. As an adult, the land still calls to me, as it truly is within the woods, glens, and desert mountains that I experience reoccurring feelings of euphoria. Because every hike is an adventure. While stationed on the Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany, I cherished the opportunities, opportunities I had to go on folks marches. These hikes began when I was presented with a booklet. The midpoint of the hike was marked with a shot of the area's best schnapps and a stamp within the book. The hike concluded with bratwurst, a stein of beer, and the retelling of our most recent hiking adventure. One of my favorite vacations was taking a self-guided hiking tour of the Wicklow Way in Ireland. With just a day pack, gaiters, and a pack lunch, I hiked 8 to 15 miles a day from bed and breakfast to bed and breakfast. The land was gloriously beautiful and rich with history and lore. But as exciting as those foreign hikes were, there is nothing more powerful than to hike upon the land of my ancestors, remembering the stories that exist within the places I walk and uncovering the stories that have been temporary, temporarily forgotten because every trail has a story. This love of the outdoors has provided me with the opportunity to weave my passion for the land into my Masters of Cultural Sustainability capstone project called Reclaiming Indigenous Place Names at Goucher College. Through this research, I discovered lost sites of spiritual significance hidden behind the labels of our Christian colonizers. When I start out on these hikes, there's a sense of anticipation and yearning, knowing that I am about to experience something wondrous and beautiful. Without fail, my curiosity and imagination are ignited. I am full of wonderings of if, how, and when my Pequot ancestors performed ceremonies in a particular glen, utilized the ravine for hunting, found shelter in a self-facing cave, or shared stories about the glacial erratics I find myself near. I take this curiosity with me when hiking outside of my homelands. The two apps I use the most for walking are All Trails and Native Land. The All Trails app literally keeps me on the right path and the Native Land app always lets me know whose ancestral lands I'm on. Today I am thankful to work as a cultural instructor where I have the opportunity to lead Pequot youth and adults on hikes within the boundaries of the reservation as I share cultural stories, our Pequot language, and hopefully plant the seeds for a life full of love and respect for the land. So I have two more pieces. Um, I'm only going to read a portion of them. One is called Reclaiming Indigenous Place Names that I mentioned in the earlier writing. So here is the introduction. So this capstone demonstrates how early Euro European colonization of North America currently affects the minds and actions of Connecticut Indians. And my dog just entered the room. My research focuses on the areas within Connecticut that are identified 
by 33 satanic place names of devil, Satan, or hell. As a Pequot living with living within the ancestral lands of my people, I find these place names offensive and not representative of the perspectives of my ancestors. So, such names are hidden in plain sight, many areas that are important to the indigenous cosmological landscape. I explored the reasons or influences behind the satanic site names and how they have had an impact on native concepts of self, place, and history. I demonstrate that these satanic place names are not isolated to the state of Connecticut, but are a part of a larger phenomenon unknown to many. Most importantly, these re this research provides evidence of satanic place names being the direct result of the Puritans' view of indigenous people of Connecticut. We were known as Satan's children. The idea of this project began as an innocent family trip to a place called Devil's Hop Yard that is located within a 45 minute drive from the Mashantucket Reservation. It was a warm and summer day. We swam in great pools of water within the shelves of the waterfall, picnicked on the peaceful glen and explored the woodlands. On the way back to our campsite, I noticed a historic marker sharing information about a hops farmer whose farm was once near the waterfall. Reading this, I couldn't help but wonder what other stories were of this place. How did my ancestors utilize the space that is now called Devil's Hop Yard? Why had such an enchanting landscape been given a derogatory name? And was there a connection between this satanic moniker and native activity? In order to strengthen native unity and pride throughout Connecticut, this research has undertaken, was undertaken to provide the tribes of Connecticut with a resource to assist our tribal governments and tribal historic preservation offices um, in our continued sovereignty efforts of reclaiming indigenous cultural landscapes. And my final piece is on powwow identity. So this is just a, a snippet of a paper I wrote. And all three of these were papers I wrote while at Goucher College. It, that school really provided me with the means to, to work on projects that were meaningful to my heart. So the culture of powwow strongly influences the development of identity in most Native American communities across Southern New England. The powwow trail nurtures the community on a social level by creating shared goals, sustaining shared beliefs, and in my experience, maintaining a shared sense of the other. Powwow provides the stimulus for many people within the Native communities to express their Native identity through the art of making and or wearing of regalia and accessories, as well as sharing and participating in dances, songs, drumming, and storytelling, and ceremonies of powwow. It is believed by some scholars that the popularity and prevalence of powwows across the nation is evident of the loss of a tribe's individual culture and traditions. These outsiders or others would have a difficult time seeing and understanding the elements of difference that separate one powwow from another. This paper describes the powwow of my Pequot community called Skimitsin and how it serves as a cultural platform for sharing the many elements of symbolic expression at powwow in our own way. From the time we enter the land of the living to the time we return homeward to the spirit world, it, powwow, connects us to our ancestors for whom dance was the expression of their soul spirit made visible and whose traditions teach us that dance extends beyond one's life to the spirit world. The, ob the above uh, Ojibwe quote eloquently gives voice to one of the great similarities among native peoples in regards to powwow, and it is that it is a spiritual event. At the same time, powwow provides each community with a platform for showcasing both these similarities as well as differences from one tribe to another. For instance, there are elements of the Skimitsin powwow that are different from other powwows, even those locally. Yet these differences are how we present our collective Pequot identity to both the native and non-native worlds. Powwows provide a safe place where it is not only okay to be native, but it's okay to express what being native means to you. Skimitsin, translated as we eat for three days, is the Thanksgiving ceremony of the Pequot people 
where the people would traditionally feast upon green corn for three days. This ancient ceremony has become a ceremony composed of many smaller ceremonies. For example, the first day of Skimitsin begins with early morning, begins in the early morning hours of Friday when the native veterans are called to the circle for the flag raising ceremony. I will now describe a couple elements which serve to create a sense of identity and belonging to my tribe. And that is the dance circle. The circle is sacred to many, if not all native people. It has been said that everything in nature tries to be round. The number four is sacred because when you have four of something, it creates a circle. The dance arena or circle is a, the entire space is allotted to the powwow is yet another circle. A powwow is a series of concentric circles, all with cultural significance. For us, we dance clockwise because to dance counterclockwise around the circle is to go against creation. The only people who are allowed to dance counterclockwise are the veterans because they have had to do things that the rest of us have not had to do in order to protect the people. Each tribe has their own rules and symbolism to support the rules for which way the dancers are to move about the circle. At Skimitsen, the circle is lined with wooden and pine bow arbor and a turtle shaped fire pit is at its center. On the Mash and Tucket Reservation in Connecticut, you enter the circle from the east and dance clockwise around the circle. At Skimitsen, prior to entering the circle, the native veterans are smudged with the burning and aromatic smoke of the white sage. The burning sage is held in a large abalone shell and the sage is kept lit by the gentle wind provided by a turkey feather fan. The person holding the sage will fan the smoke under the, over the head, chest, legs, and feet of each person. The person being smudged knows to then turn around so the process can be then begin from their feet, this time concluding at their head, finally forming a standing circle of smoke. Being smudged in public is just one of the many ways to show the community that you hold true to the traditional ways of the people. Perception of the outsiders. Powwows affect the perceptions others have of Native Americans, both positively and negatively. Powwows help positive position the perceptions others have in Native, of Native Americans because they showcase the community for all to see and essentially say, we are still here. We are not vanishing. And we do not have to meet your criteria of who or what a Native is. That alone is for us to decide. I've witnessed spectators here in New England who after they've seen the white, brown, and black natives at powwow together make negative judgments. They sometimes ask questions about blood quantum or ask probing questions about how native populations were able to sustain their identity in the face of genocide. At the same time, the powwows provide a means to share the outsiders, all the many ways available for a person to be a Native American in the 21st century. Non-Native spectators will learn that a Native doesn't have to compete in powwow in order to participate. They can organize the event, be a spectator, an artist, musician, chef, vendor, dignitary, royalty, title holder, or a member of the Veterans Honor Guard. That said, I invite you again to the Skimitsen powwow this August 28th and 29th, Katapatiamu. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ruth Torres and I'm Scattercook. Our reservation is in the Northwest part of Connecticut on the New York state line. And before I continue, I want you to know that the Scattercook people identify as the land from which we come. We are Scattercook, a place and a people. Recently, when I was asked by a reporter why I write, I didn't have an immediate answer. It's a question I don't think I've ever been asked before. So I've been thinking about it for a few weeks now. I don't know, I know I don't write for pleasure or for release or to fulfill some creative need. I write when I think there's something important to say or to make a document for the public record. I write to educate and to inform. I read for pleasure. 
If you pick up a copy of Dawnland Voices, you will see the introduction to the Scattercook section that I co-authored with another Scattercook woman, Trudy Lamb Richmond. It speaks of our history, how various public policies have affected our tribe and our lives. We speak of people and times that should not be forgotten. My eulogy for Irving Harris, my uncle, is included in Dawnland Voices. Being a bit nerdy, I'm glad my sister panelists provided the creative content for this panel today. Seven years ago, uh, today, Connecticut uh, Mirror, ctmirror.org, published a somewhat snarky opinion piece I had wrote about the federal acknowledgement process. It's titled, Six Things You Did Not Know About the Federal Acknowledgement of Indian Tribes. And here it is. Okay, I admit it. You caught me. I use that headline because I'm deluged with this type of attention grabber when I'm reading online news and using social media. And I just can't help myself. I have to find out what the 10 tricks are to keeping the airline from losing my luggage, the five magic foods I should be eating, and the 300 things that successful people don't do. But don't click away from this opinion piece just yet. You may actually read something that you hadn't considered before. Number one, yes, Virginia and Connecticut and California, there really are tribes east of the Mississippi and further west than Arizona, and they continue to exist today. Because you don't know their histories, never learned about them in school, and never saw a movie about them starring Kevin Costner, does not prove that these tribes disappeared. Tribes in these states and others have distinct histories, but many share the challenges presented by the existing administrative process to determine if a tribe will be acknowledged by the federal government. How exactly does a petitioning tribe produce documents that show evidence of their political and social activities during times when government policies were determined to annihilate and assimilate indigenous peoples? Number two, Contrary to what you may hear from public officials in Connecticut, there will still be many obstacles for tribes petitioning under the proposed changes to the acknowledgement process and beyond that process. Back in 2005, when many of these same public officials were running around with their hair on fire because Scattercokes and Eastern Pequots were federally re recognized, the US Supreme Court decided the city of Sherrill versus Oneida Indian tribe case. To be clear, I'm not a lawyer, legal scholar, or expert, but anyone can find explanations of this case in plain English. In short, the Oneidas legally purchased private properties in New York, which the city of Sherrill wanted to tax. And the court held that, quote, given the longstanding, distinctly non-Indian character of central New York and its inhabitants, the regulatory authority over the area constantly exercised by the state and its counties and towns for 200 years, and the Oneida's long delay in seeking judicial relief against parties other than the United States, standards of federal Indian law and federal equity, equity practice preclude the tribe from unilaterally reviving its ancient sovereignty in whole or in part over the parcels at issue. Yes, that was plain English. Plainer still are my words. Connecticut landowners, you can relax now, and you can thank Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Even if tribes here have legitimate claims to dispossessed land that you now call home, or if tribes purchase land in the future, tribal sovereignty will not automatically be restored on those lands. With the reform of the recognition process, tribes still retain the burden of satisfying rigorous criteria, demonstrating that they have survived against the many pressures of annihilation and assimilation. And even upon recognition, there is no guarantee of land of tribal government authority over land, and certainly no guarantee that gaming development would either be permissible or economically practical. A long and deep recession stands between the glory days of Indian gaming expansion and the present economic realities. And if that weren't enough to make folks relax, there's that pesky 2009 Cartieri versus Salazar decision that limits the federal government from acquiring new trust land for the tribes. Relax already, put the hair fires out and get better legal advice. Number three, tribal sovereignty and federal acknowledgement are not gifts, prizes, or awards. Tribes cannot win, ding, 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 recognition. When a tribe is on the US government's list of recognized tribes, it means that the US government has acknowledged a relationship that is mandated by the constitution. A successful petition for federal acknowledgement is a finding 
that a tribe has been improperly overlooked and that the federal relationship was previously neglected. The federal government cannot grant, bestow, award tribal identity. It acknowledges that which already exists. The use of language in media outlets and coming from government officials is like the proverbial bouncing ball. Follow the bouncing ball in Connecticut. Tribe is the word you first heard the state's various elected officials use when referring to Connecticut's tribes. Eastern Pequot, Golden Hill Pagusset, Mashantucket Pequot, uh, Mohegan and Scaticook. Based on the political strategies deployed against the tribes, the words evolved in an effort to use language to change reality. Our tribes were spoken of as tribal groups, Indian groups, and the whispered message, not Indian. A new name emerged in the Connecticut governor's February 2014 letter to President Obama. Verbal calisthenics meant to minimize, perhaps even dismiss the state's relationships with the tribes. He referred to them, us, as living descendants of the groups for which the reservations were first established. Huh? This is not the first time that Connecticut, this is number four, by the way, this is not the first time that Connecticut public officials demanded changes to the federal acknowledgement regulations. Inflammatory cries like fundamentally flawed, not transparent enough, and impose a moratorium on recognition decisions until we can fix this system were aimed at the federal acknowledgement process and hurled at the Bureau of Indian Affairs starting in 2000 when the BIA determined that the Eastern Pequot petition had passed muster and would continue forward toward a final federal acknowledgement determination. This same year, the New York Times reported that a BIA researcher told Connecticut's former attorney general, you might not like hearing this, but the best evidence supporting the Eastern Pequot's federal recognition comes from the state's own record, comes from the fact that the state has maintained and documented a continuous government to government relationship. There was actually a shortage of soapboxes until 2005 when political pressure succeeded in having both the Eastern Pequot and the Scaticook federal recognition decisions overturned. Until then, the soapboxes were set out regularly. We have to fix this broken process was a common theme, but the deployed strategies and public record indicate that the officials didn't care about the broken process. They cared and still do about controlling gaming expansion. And they act as if the only way to prevent another casino from cropping up in the state is to cut off the petitioners at the pass. 14 years ago, the marriage of gaming and federal recognition was celebrated in Hartford, Kent, North Stonington and Washington, DC. Well played and professionally executed. Number five, Changing the regulations that acknowledge tribes is a remedy to address a social justice issue. Does it make it easier for tribes? The Obama administration is accused of making it easy for tribes to petition for acknowledgement. Easier perhaps, but not easy. Hmm, did the abolition of Jim Crow laws make it easier for blacks to vote? Did the reformation of child labor laws make it easier for children working under oppressive and unsafe conditions? Does the 2009 Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act make it easier for women to earn equal pay? Yup. And changing the acknowledgement regulations will make this process more transparent and amenable to evaluation and oversight. However, even with reform, acknowledgement will not be easy. Rebuilding a tribal nation's infrastructure after nearly 400 years of purposeful demolition is difficult and over the last decade has been further complicated by US Supreme Court rulings. And by the way, this is a national issue affecting the future of Indian peoples across the country, and none of the local media outlets are reporting on that. Number six, federal acknowledgement of Connecticut tribes is the small picture. In 2010, the Obama administration announced its support for the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. One of the last few colonial holdouts, the United States, we finally endorsed a non-binding statement on how the world's nation states must understand, negotiate with, and live among the world's indigenous populations. Engaged groups with diverse stakeholders spent more than 25 years to, to produce the declaration, which was finalized in 2007. The declaration, quote, solemnly proclaims the following in part, as a standard of achievement to be pursued in a spirit of partnership and mutual respect. 
In Article 8, it says, nation states shall provide effective mechanisms for prevention of and redress for any action which has the aim or effect of dispossessing them of their lands, territories, or resources. Five of the six reservations in Connecticut were established long before the state of Connecticut was established. The Connecticut colonial government set aside land for the exclusive use of the tribes, and these long-standing reservations are substantially important evidence of continuous tribal existence. The proposed regulations acknowledge this while the state is trying to deny it. So when the next news story you read is that Connecticut is trying to abolish the remaining state reservations so that the state can evade the impact of potential changes to the federal acknowledgement regulations, would you kindly think of these six things you did not know about the federal acknowledgement of Indian tribes? Thanks. I um, would also like to read an excerpt written by my friend, uh, my mentor, my co-editor, who was a lifelong student and educator, Trudy Lamb Richmond, and you've heard her name several times this evening. Um, this is part of her writings in Dawnland Voices, and um, it's called Growing Up Indian or Trying to in Southern New England. Trudy passed away five weeks ago at the age of 89, and she leaves a void I cannot adequately describe. So this is just an excerpt. I was in the third grade when we moved. The school was about two miles away, but my family was told that we lived too close to the school for me to ride the bus. Because my mother and grandmother didn't drive and my father left for work early, I walked. I walked until I learned to ride a bike. I had walked to school when we lived in the city, but the school was only two blocks away and I walked with the other children in the neighborhood. But this was a two mile walk and I walked alone. I never saw another child while walking to school and it was a long time before I made friends. In the seventh grade, my class was given a writing project as homework. The day we turned our papers in, we had a substitute teacher, the principal's wife. The day we, excuse me, she had that attitude that made me put my head down. Before the end of the day, she told me that I had to stay after school and rewrite my paper because she didn't believe I had written it. And I had never stayed after school before, and I was the only one. It was embarrassing and lonely. But these were things you just accepted. I don't remember the assignment. I don't remember what I wrote about, but I do remember her attitude and the feeling that emerged because of it. There were certain adults and even some classmates who had expressed that attitude. These were things you learned to accept. There were many other discoveries like that, but the one that topped the seventh grade experience was during my senior year in high school. I was to be one of eight students selected to speak at a graduation. The teacher called each one of us up to her desk to select a specific ethnic group from a list she had compiled. We would be asked to research the group we had selected and then write about the contributions they had made to the rest of the world. I was so excited. Here was my opportunity to talk about American Indians, to talk about my people, to really be me. It would mean that the entire graduation audience and my family would get to hear me. But the feeling of such pride only lasted a fleeting moment. American Indians were not on the teacher's coveted list. I was told that American Indians had not many, if any, important contributions. That was one of the deepest wounds and one of the most difficult of all the discoveries imposed upon me. She had been one of the few teachers I had admired. How could she be so wrong? As quickly as she had given me recognition, she had taken it away. But just like every other occasion, I did not speak up a protest. It was not acceptable behavior. Thank you. Well, that was beautiful. Thank you everybody for reading. I saw some uh, comments in the chat about powerful women reading and it occurs to me that <laughs> it is all women or female identified folks on the screen and um, in the Dumbland Voices book also, a lot of women, 
most of the tribal community editors are women. And I wonder if any of you or all of you would like to speak to that, the role, uh, what Rachel's mom, Melissa Tantaquid and Zobel has called women's socio-cultural leadership. Um, I noticed too that you're also all very conscious of the writers who came before you and the writers who write alongside you, which I think is beautiful. But any, anyone want to take a crack at that? Dressing the role of women? Um, I, I'll say, I just, I just know growing up, I had a lot of strong um, female role models in, in my tribe. When I, when I looked up, I always saw a woman leading and like that encouraged me to write. And then when I first got into writing, there was women writing in the tribe, like writing speeches, our chairwoman. Like I can remember, I used to get her speeches and I would read them over and over again. And I was trying to like practice them in front of the mirror. So it was just kind of like, just women have always been in that power of leadership or at least for us. I love that image. Rachel? Yeah, I mean, here in Southern New England, we are matriarchal, matrilineal societies, and that is different throughout Indian country. So, you know, sometimes when you might go out West, you might have a different structure and a different way that things are set up in a ceremony. And obviously it's all very different, but here, um, many of the culture bearers are women. Um, my tribe actually currently has a female chief, which is very exciting. And she's not the first, Lynn Malerba, who is um, just does stuff all over Indian country for women. And she's fantastic. Um, you know, so with my family, um, we are also culture bearers and also medicine people and, and healers as well as educators. So we take on a lot of different hats as a kind of intergenerational family of teachers and healers. And um, just wanted to show this, even though I think it's hard to get, and this is Gladys's book on the yes, herbs and the ethnobotany, uh, folk medicine of the Delaware and related Algonquian Indians. Um, and some of the work that I also do is revitalizing plants among my people. So if, if you check out that other article um, on the Dawnland Voices, it talks about the food a little bit. Uh, but but it's one of those things that a lot of us kind of touched on here too is is the plants and things of that nature and um, you know again there's a lot more to it we all had our had our roles as you know men women two spirits and two spirits being highly honored um, LGBTQs being very so just I'll just put that out for Pride Month that we as indigenous people traditionally this was like a very respected thing to be a two spirit and. Um, so even that is very different. But again, you know, um, we each had our roles. And here in southern New England, as most of us are presenting on behalf of our ancestries, we are all from these families where, as Natasha so beautifully said, you know, we were passed down um, these traditions from strong female role models. I also myself definitely had some males as well. But um, the women are the are a lot of the culture bearers and the people doing it. And um, oh yeah, one thing about Gladys, she, in the 1920s, I didn't mention, she also was a woman who was in the field of anthropology and um, didn't go to high school, skipped college. And, um, you know, she's, she, there's more information about her out there. Um, you can check out my mother's book, Medicine Trail, as well as many other articles. But she is just one of many indigenous women who were known as informants in that time. You can also check out Margaret Bruchak's work about that topic specifically. Great, thanks, Rachel. Sharan, did you have words on this topic? Um, yeah, the women are um, the backbone, the healers. Uh, they're also in many brackets, you know, the beginning and the end. So I just wanted to add to that. Wonderful. You know, another thing I thought of when I was listening to Ruth read with such humor, you know, and beginning with Natasha with poetry, I always want to ask writers this question, and sometimes writers don't like to talk about it, so you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but what, what, what made you choose the particular form or the particular medium that you wrote in? I mean, I gather that Candace, you know, was in college and had an opportunity to write these pieces that were meaningful, but can any of you talk about why you chose, this is sort of a literary question, like why this literary form felt like the right form for what you wanted to do? I don't mind going. Yeah. Um, 
well, for the op-ed piece, uh, I realized that um, there are different kinds of writings, right? So I've written papers like Candy has for, you know, for school. I've, um, in fact, the paper I wrote in an American public policy class started as that, turned into a panel at an indigenous, Native American indigenous studies conference. And that turned into the chapter in the book, uh, Recognition, Sovereignty, Struggles and Indigenous Rights. And um, so I think that, so, and I'm not the creative person. I think I gave that disclaimer at the beginning, but I think that there's a different audience perhaps for different um, medium, I guess, types of writing. And, um, and a academic paper or something that you publish like that, there are certainly a lot of rules um, even with um, more creative writing, there are rules when you're going to publish something. Um, and the op-ed piece, for me at least, gave me um, a venue to um, be snarky um, and, um, and to appeal to a broader audience of just regular folks reading the CT Mirror website. So um, I think it, that's what I think when I'm you know, deciding what to write. Great. Let's hear it for Scatacook Snark. <laughs> More of this, please. Natasha, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you were the only one who happened to read poetry. And I was just wondering why poetry? Um, for me in college, I had a Native American professor who like changed my life, Meredith James. And she got, in, she got, like, got me into it. And then for me, I realized with poetry, I could convey the pain that I felt and I could get that across. Like there's a lot of passionate things that I was saying because I experienced those firsthand. Like I can still remember when I, like I was talking about the day we're celebrating. I can remember that day they took away our photo recognition and how it was Columbus day and it was raining. And everywhere I looked around, elders were in tears. Like there's things about that day that would just, if I didn't write about them, I don't know where I would be. And I think poetry took the best form of being able to express all of those emotions. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, I was, oh, yeah. I was just going to say, I'm working on some poetry. It is not ready yet, but um, I took advantage of an opportunity. Um, and I agree with what Natasha is saying. It's, I, <laughs> I took advantage of an opportunity through the North American Indian Center of Boston. They offered a free indigenous writing group the past three months. So it's been my therapy amongst other things. Um, shout out to Ella. Alkowitz for that, um, an Inupiaq author who is just an incredible human being. Um, I've been dealing with um, some trauma in um, higher ed uh, and <laughs> that's all I'll say. So um, so it, it was definitely, I can I know what Natasha's saying, it was, it was very therapeutic um, when you're going through something like that where you feel as if, you know, there's so many traumas we experience as indigenous people throughout the country and Southern New England specifically on a daily basis, whether it's someone questioning our identity um, as Candace kind of spoke about or our languages constantly having to be revitalized and that whole mess that, you know, we struggle with. And um, there's just so many topics that that can be brought to light. Um, and I think that that poetry is, is definitely something that I will be pursuing further because it does, it can kind of just bring that out. Um, but this personal, this paper I read was, was also an academic paper. And my other paper that um, is on the website is actually um, more of a, an essay and was not for school. The one on Native American foods of New England, of Southern New England specifically, you can find that on the um, Dawnland Voices page. I wonder if any of you have questions or comments for each other, because I think the pu the broader public was not privy to the private chat that was going on, but there was a private chat going on, which to me was really exciting. I mean, you were trading stories, you know, and I would see Natasha say, wow, thank you for telling that story, or I didn't hear that story before. And um, I, I wonder if you have comments or questions for each other. Well, there's definitely an overlap between Rachel Sayet's research and my own, um, you know, studying the the legends, the stories of 
the land that we live in is for me quite powerful knowing um, that there are so many places of spiritual significance you know, within a drive that have been lost to us. Like we have forgotten. Um, and Trudy, she was one of my interviewees and she said that the research was you know, bringing back you know, and creating a re-remembering of the stories and had the research, um, you know, I wish I could continue with it because it definitely didn't, uh, it, it didn't flourish as much as I would have liked it to. Um, in a perfect world, there would have been someone from each community, you know, Rachel, Sharon was, um, I interviewed her as well, um, that we would, we would go to each of those locations and write about how it made us feel, um, you know, reclaiming these spaces. So Rachel, if you're ever up for a project <laughs> or a road trip and Sharon, let me know. I I just really quick, I just wanted to say, like, thank you, Ruth, too, for driving home that point of everything that happened on that day and just having more, giving more context to it. And it just, it feels great to have people continue to tell our story. And Sharon, you too, it's always a pleasure being on any panel with you. You know how much you inspire me. I, I could tell you that for days, how how incredible of a leader you are. I just want to throw that out there too. But just thank you being for a long time, that like I keep saying that for a long time, the state of Connecticut has kept our tribes voiceless and and mm -hmm. and they haven't given us the opportunity to tell our story. And every time we've tried, they, they shut us up, whether it was through politics, whether it was whatever kind of yeah. BS it was. So it's yeah. just, it's, it's beautiful. And I thank you guys so much for just giving us this platform to be able to have a voice. Mm -hmm. Cause a mm -hmm. lot of times like we get forgotten in all of this. So a lot of times the state recognized tribes get forgotten in all of this. So I just, again, I want to thank you so much for just giving us this opportunity to have a voice and tell a story. Thank you. I'd even be sassier and say that it's not just that you're being forgotten, but actively suppressed. You, you know, so the, the maddening thing, you know, Rachel held up the book, you know, by Gladys, that book is out of print. And Sharon read from A Quarter Acre of Heartbreak and that book is out of print. I mean, native writers, mm -hmm. even when they do get published, go out of print in a minute and a half. And I often think if I had, if I was, if I was a billionaire, like I would start a press that would just keep all of this stuff in print. But the extraordinary thing is that you all remember them you all keep copies of this stuff and hand them around and keep them in your tribal archives. And um, I mean, maybe some of you would like to talk about other books, other indigenous authored books that have been important to you. I just wanted to mention, just because I did say this was out of print, it's actually available for free on Google Books now. Ooh. <laughs> so it's actually available. Okay. So again, um, I can type the name so they can put it in the chat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I can I can continue, I guess, if no one else wants to go. I, I did want to mention um, a couple of the people who I already quoted in the paper were um, Margaret Bruchak and Joseph Bruchak, um, who I was raised with, um, Abenaki storytellers, um, very prolific authors. Um, Joe's work is all over the map from children's books to um, young adult to history. And then we have Marge, who's a lot of it's mostly different articles and a lot of it is specifically about wampum, which I'm not choosing to wear today. I'm not sure, I can't really see candy, but she might be. Um, <laughs> and um, I mentioned it in the panel I was in last night, but I'll mention it again. We did not use it as money. It was more of a, you know, a gift between tribes, peace relations, also a spiritual cleanser has a lot more meaning to it. Um, then what the, the colonists kind of took it as that, but Marge writes quite a bit about wampum. So you can look, um, Margaret Bruchak up for that. Um, obviously, um, my, you know, Gladys also inspired me and, and my mother, although we do different writing, she, she, she's does the creative as Siobhan mentioned, <laughs> Melissa Zobel. <laughs> <laughs> and your sister <laughs> writing plays and yeah. Great. Well, it looks like we have two minutes left. Does anybody have any final comments or things you really want the audience to hear? I just want to say thank you to everybody um, 
for all the indigenous writers of Connecticut. I'm honored that we all were on this panel working together and I hope you know we can work together again later on in the future. And I'm thankful for all the audience that was interested and in, um, watch this live. Thank you. Candy, any final parting shots? Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this, to share a few pieces of my work. Um, I hope someday to be published um, and I'll be sure to put it on social media when that happens. And it is lovely to see all of your faces and Natasha, I'll most likely be reaching out to you for maybe a youth poetry workshop or something along those lines. Yes. So, Definitely. Top of team. Thank you. Perfect. Natasha, any final words? Um, I just want to say thank you again. Like I said, it's always lovely when we get a chance to tell our story. And this was a beautiful panel. And I thank you guys too. Thank you. Great. Ruth. Well, I'm going to add my thanks and also thank the uh, New Haven Museum for their support in making this happen tonight. And um, hopefully uh, they could. Um, provide some other avenues for similar events. This would be really fun. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, everybody. It was wonderful to meet those of you who I hadn't been able to meet before. And um, also always great to see Ruth and Rachel again and, and our beautiful ASL interpreters. Um, Suzanne warned us that fast sign language is still legend, but even the fast looked really, really good. It looked good. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Thank you, Siobhan. Thanks to everyone. Um, I did want to quickly mention the other Don, the Donland Voices writers. I, I don't know if I'll get them all, but the other ones who are featured from my tribe, um, Joe Smith and William Donahue and Stephanie Fielding, who is the editor, and Melissa Tantagridge and Zobel, and my sister, <laughs> Madeline Sayet. Yes. Now the magazine is going to embrace Pequod and Pagwasset writers. Very exciting about that. Okay. Yes, thank you. And thank you all so much for joining us and for being a part uh, a part of this year's festival. It is, it is an honor to witness your words and I'm so excited for them to continue. Like, let's speak it out. Let's have them publish. Let's publish this. Let's get it. Let's, let's get it out there. Um, and I, I wanted to bring in uh, some words from Joy Harjo, um, if that's all right with all of you, uh, to close us out from American Sunrise. Uh, and this is a poem called Seven Generations. Children play with full bellies at the edge of the mating dance, beneath a sky thrown open to the need of stars to know themselves against the dark. All night we dance the weave of joy and tears. All night we're lit with the sunrise of forever. Just ahead of us through the trees, one generation after the other. And that's from American Sunrise. Uh, it was uh, beautiful to get to be backstage with each, with each and every one of these uh, phenomenal writers right here uh, on these lands, our neighbors and, our, and the people who have been here for a long time. So thank you. Special thanks also to Ruth Torres and Eleanor Salumba for all of their work behind the scenes to make this possible. You can get a copy of Joy Harjo's American Sun Sunrise and Dawnland Voices uh, through the New Haven Free Public Library and local bookstores. Um, don't forget to please let us know what you think. Check it out at our audience survey at artidea.org slash survey. Uh, it just takes a couple of minutes and it's a huge help in helping us understand your experience of the festival this year. Uh, moving along in our festival, we do have a lot still coming up. Um, as was mentioned, Rachel Sayet's sister, Madeline Sayet has a play, Where We Belong, that will be premiering as a part of this year's festival. Next week, we have another ideas event Imagining the 15 Minute City and the Future of Transportation in partnership with the Connecticut Mirror and Pickard Chilton. So you can check all of this out at artidea.org and I look forward to seeing you all soon. Have a beautiful evening. Thank
journey, growing freely, no ceiling.